anniversary series and um, we have started with do you remember what the first one was okay be joyful in hope and we talked about why we can be joyful in hope it's not like the world hopes it is not oh well I hope it will I hope so instead it is what I know so I know so and we can have hope because it's based on the Word of God what he has done already because of what he's done already we can then have hope for what he will yet do that's right move move wherever you want to or need to or that's okay that's okay and if the we're trying to get the temperature regulated still it's Keith how's it going back there um, we're, it's pretty cold okay adjust it if you need to okay uh, but uh, yeah okay and and over here Stephen's your go-to on this side Keith's your go-to on that side John we're gonna make you the go-to but you don't have any you don't have any controls See if you can pray for it. <laughs> okay, it's always it's always a little bit difficult because we're trying to get everybody all over the church uh, just right. So, uh, just give them uh, th they'll get it worked out, but we'll keep on going. So, our uh, it was uh, to be joyful in hope. What was our second one last week? What was it? Okay, patient in affliction was our second one. It kind of gets harder, doesn't it? it? It seems to be getting harder and harder and harder, being patient in affliction. And we talked about this, why it's not easy to be patient in affliction. Why, what is the, what is the encouragement to be patient in affliction? We talked about this last week. We, be, we are patient in affliction because there is a sure reward at at the end when we go through this affliction it can be anything and remember it's not just uh, it's not just oh I am being a Christian and so I'm being persecuted because I'm being a Christian that is not it it is anything any trouble that you go through in this world whether it is sickness whether it is financial difficulties whether it is wayward children whether it is uh, something in your own life, all of these things are included. And as we go through with patience, with patience, as He is helping us, we will go through it and we will receive the reward that comes from going through that patience. There's a reward at the end of it and there's an increasing of strength as we go through it. And then today, we come to the third uh, in our... In our uh, uh, in our theme for the anniversary. So we've looked at joyful, pa patient, and what's the third one? Faithful. This is from Romans 12, 12. Be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. And um, so we're going to look at this one today. And uh, almost all of us, I'm guessing, when we come to this one, we m many of us start feeling guilty, right? Because if our prayer lives were uncovered before everyone else in the church... A lot of us would just be so ashamed, right? Or we would feel so inadequate. We, we feel, even if they're not, our prayer lives aren't shown to people, we feel so guilty when we come to this, don't we? So many of us do. We feel like, I, I'm, so, I'm such a wimp in this area of prayer. I'm such a, I, I, I wish I could be like that person, but me, I'm like this. And so we're going to look at this this morning, and I want to encourage you this morning that God gives some great examples that will not discourage you, but will encourage you. I used to love to read Christian biographies, but you know, in reading these great Christian biographies, so often there would be a small part of encouragement and there would be a large part of condemnation because I thought, I fall so far short. Um, and I think a lot of us feel that way. But God includes some wonderful examples in His Word that will challenge us this morning in a, in a good way as we come to prayer and as we come to being faithful in prayer. So let's look at what God's Word tells us, because we have all sorts of ideas about prayer. Um, and you know what? A lot of ideas and a lot of feelings that we have about prayer, they're just wrong. They're just wrong. They're lies. And the devil makes us feel guilty, and then instead of praying more, we pray less, right? 
because we feel so condemned. So we're going to look at the Word of God this morning. Uh, look at your Bibles, if you have them, whether electronic or on paper. And let me give you some translations for this faithful in prayer. I think we used, I think this is the NIV translation, but you'll find other translations. Some of you have some, is that, is that the NIV? Does it say faith? Have you got NIV? Kim, what does it say in King James, John? Okay, continuing steadfastly in prayer. I've got that one. So that's the King James, continuing steadfastly. Somebody else, another translation. Do you have one? Constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. So I'm guessing that's ESV, right? Okay, constant in prayer. Anybody else, a different translation? Devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. What's that one? Okay, New American Standard. Okay, anybody else? These are a variety of them. Let me give you a few more. Uh, from the message. Um, keep on praying, be persistent in prayer, continuing steadfastly in prayer, persist in prayer, earnest and persistent pr and persistent in prayer. So these are some of the translations for us and all of them give us the same, uh, give us pretty much the same feeling, don't they? If we looked at what it means literally, and since it's the New Testament, it's in the Greek, the, the exact meaning in the New Testament is literally is to be strong towards something. So of course there's the literal meaning, then we have these other things. So to be strong towards something. So this is not just a call to pray, because we hear messages about praying, right? This takes it a step further and a step higher, um, and it reflects an, uh, an encouragement to persist and continue in prayer. Um, so as we look at this, I want us to think for just a minute about some of the reasons we don't persist in prayer, some of the ideas we have about persisting in prayer, and some of the feelings uh, when we come to this, and some of the excuses that we make for not being very strong in prayer. So I read your mail, and this is what you and I have thought at various times. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Why don't we persist in prayer? Why aren't we faithful in prayer? Part of it is because we've never developed, we've just never developed a pattern of prayer. A lot of us, when we don't really pray very much in our lives, there's, there's no condemnation here, brothers and sisters, but we don't pray a lot in our lives. But when a crisis comes, we contact somebody that we think does pray. We say, please pray for me, right? And we pray a little bit, but we're really counting on the prayers of this other person who really prays a lot, um, who knows God better. Uh, some of us don't persist in prayer because we feel, sorry to say, but you know this is true, we feel prayer doesn't really work. Have you ever felt that? Yeah. A lot of us, prayer doesn't really work. Um, a lot of us don't persist in prayer because we, and this is similar to what, what, we just, what I just said, that I prayed but there was no answer there was, and nothing changed and so I just stopped praying. There was no answer. Um, some of us think, well, God is God. He's sovereign. He's going to do what he's going to do anyhow. So, you know, why pray? A lot of people think that. Some of us, we don't think it, but we live it. I can live my life without a lot of prayer. I'm doing okay. How many of you have ever, don't raise your hands, but we know that's true, don't we? The, some of you are smiling at me right now because you know it's true. Um, and you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, that's shocking. No, Christians don't, Christians don't think that. Well, baloney, of course Christians think that because that's how we live a lot of times, right? We really do. I, I'm doing okay. Um, and I'm doing okay without prayer. And then we just kind of go along on our way. Some of us would say, prayer is not my gift. Have you ever thought that? Some of us think that, right? I'm not a prayer warrior like fill in the blank. This person is a prayer warrior. Um, and so we're going to talk about that this morning because that's kind of baloney too. Sorry. Um, and then some of us are not consi consistent in prayer because you know what? Prayer is hard sometimes, right? It's just hard. I can pray two minutes and I'm thinking about, let's see, for lunch. Oh, sorry, Lord. And, and oh, and where am I going to get that? Oh, oh sorry, Lord. Um, Prayer is hard. So let's look at what the Bible says this morning. Uh, and if I'd asked you to raise your hand on any one of these things, everybody here would have raised a hand for one of those things, right? Everybody would, and I include myself in that. But God's Word gives us some encouragements and some things that can help us in this area. So I don't want you to be condemned this morning 
but I want the Holy Spirit to speak to us because when God says be faithful in prayer, brothers and sisters, he has a good reason for telling us to be faithful in prayer. And it's going to encourage us and help us this morning to be faithful in prayer, also uh, in obedience to his word. So what does it mean to be faithful in prayer? Um, does it mean I should pray a lot? Uh, does it mean I should take a bunch? Oh, nice cup. <laughs> does it mean um, I should read a bunch of books about prayer? Does it, what does it mean? I believe from, from looking at the various verses and, and studying, I think there are two parts to this. Okay, we're going to look at both of them uh, for a little while this morning. There are two parts to being faithful in prayer uh, or persisting in prayer or being steadfast in prayer. And they fit together. Now, I think one side's bigger than the other side, but let's look at these two parts together. And I'm, I've chosen two words to help us. So what it means to be faithful in prayer first is to be consistent, okay? So I'm going to give you two words that sound very similar that will help you to remember. So when it says to be faithful in prayer, the first one is to be consistent in prayer, okay? To be consistent in prayer. Let's look at that. Uh, so whether you're in a crisis or not, prayer is part of your regular daily life in some way, every, every day or throughout the day. It's part of your life. So, and that's what it means in the first one, to be consistent in prayer, uh, to be faithful in prayer. It just means to be consistent, to be consistent. Uh, a lot of you know that, um, uh, that Sister Betty was my flatmate for many, many, many years. And I, one of the testimonies I have, uh, I would say about Betty is this, she was consistent in prayer. Every single evening after dinner, she'd say, okay, I'll be back later. Didn't matter what was on television. Didn't matter what was going on. She went up to her room and for about an hour, she included Bible reading in that, but for about an hour, she closed the door to her room and she was being consistent in prayer, consistent in prayer. And that has been just a testimony to me through, through the years as well. So first, the first thing is it just means just to be, just to be consistent in prayer. And I want to give, us, give you some examples. Let's look at some verses. And I've been really careful this morning. I want to give us some Old Testament and some New Testament. Do we need any Chinese translation? We don't, do we? Okay, we're good. Letty, I think you can sit down if you want to, but you can stay up there if you want to. Um, so let's look, let me give you an Old Testament example. Here's a man that we know who prayed a lot. I'm not going to read all, all of these things, but just as a, if you want to take notes or just as a reminder, we all know about Daniel. What's one of your favorite Sunday school stories? If you grew up in, in Sunday school, Daniel in the lion's den, okay? And here's an example of consistency in prayer in the Old Testament. Um, Darius was the ruler. He had taken over, he had uh, defeated, he had conquered the kingdom, and, um, the, and Darius decided he was going to make uh, several of his officials the top leaders in the country. And Daniel was one of them. But Daniel was so efficient through God's help. You see, when, when you put God first in your life, is not the message, but when you would put God first in our life, do you know that God will give you honor and advancement in your secular work? If you honor God in your life, God will honor you in your work. He will do that. That's what God does. And we see the example time and time again. Daniel put God first and he honored God in his way of working. And just the same thing happened with Joseph. And so Daniel, he, he's so good at what he does, the king decides, I'm going to make him number two. He's going to be the prime minister. Uh, and these other ungodly officials get jealous and they say, how can we trip up Daniel? And the only way they can trip him up is that we, is that we can get him through his, through his faith in God. We know he, prayers, he prays. Honestly, what a testimony, right? We know that we can catch him in prayer. So they concoct some sort of law and they go to Darius and say, for 30 days, people can only pray to you. And Darius, being a proud monarch, says, yeah, I like that. Wouldn't you like that? Everybody, for 30 days, all, they only honor you. They only pray to you. And so look at this. Uh, when Daniel learned that law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down. How? As usual, in his upstairs room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he'd always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying 
and asking God for help. So here's an Old Testament example for us. He was just, he was consistent in prayer. He was consistent in prayer. Let me give you a New Testament example as well. And Jesus is a pretty good New Testament example, right? And here's a good one for us, for those of us that say, well, I kind of, I'm, I, you know, I don't pray a lot, I know, but I'm kind of, you know, it's not my gift, I'm doing okay. If Jesus prayed consistently, how much more do we need to? Look with me at this. So he's healing people, he's casting out demons, he's doing all sorts of wonderful things. The news spreads more and more. Great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to desolate places and prayed. And to me, this is kind of amazing. He's in the middle. We, we sometimes feel, so, get, we're so busy, aren't we? I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Jesus in his busyness knew, I got to pray. I got to pray. And so there was consistent prayer. So this first picture we see is of to be faithful in prayer is to be consistent in prayer. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about that in just a minute. So this consistent prayer gives us direction and strength for daily responsibilities, the things that you go through in the day. Um, and it may be, you may not have a lot of time. It may be a little bit like salt and pepper that is sprinkled throughout your life, uh, throughout the day, but find some time. For me, and, and for me, anyhow, one of the, two of the times I pray, I pray when I'm driving. We need to in Hong Kong, right? <laughs> but I, but I'm, I pray as I'm driving back and forth, and sometimes it can be pretty long. I do other things as well. Um, I watch the road, but I pray often because I'm by myself and nobody's around. And so I'm praying as I'm driving. And the second time um, is as I climb the mountain. Uh, behind my house several times a week. Uh, I pray, I pray and I sing and I do things as I climb up the mountain, as I climb down again. Now I'm doing other things as well. I'm looking at birds. I stop and take pictures. Oh, that's a pretty flower, things like that. But I spend, I spend time. So what I think, brothers and sisters, is this, as we, as we look at this, there's a time for consistent prayer where you really withdraw. G get alone with God, right? Get alone with God away from people. Um, but then let it be part of your life as well. So we, we see this, but I want you to look at one other part. So consistent prayer means it's part of our lives, but there's another part of consistent prayer. Look at this as well. And we, in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel had another vision. So we go back to this man who really is a prayer. And when this vision came to me, I was in mourning for three whole weeks. I ate no rich food. I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. And he takes time in fasting and prayer. Why? In a time of crisis, okay? So in a time of crisis, there's consistent prayer. What I have found is this. If you and I will develop a pattern of prayer, daily prayer in our lives, then when the crises come in our lives, we'll be able to quickly enter God's presence and say, oh God, help me in those times of crisis as well. And that's part of consistent prayer. Here's Jesus again. Uh, here's the second. So I'm using the same example, Old Testament, New Testament. And so <clears throat> during those days, he went on, out to the mountain to pray and he spent all night in prayer to God. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he do that? The next verse tells us, when daylight came, he summoned his disciples and he chose 12 of them and he named them apostles. Jesus himself, in part of his faithful, consistent prayer, knew this is a time where I need more direction from the Lord. So part of his consistent pattern was on a daily basis, but also in crisis, also in crisis. And I want you to see one thing. For sure, when you're in crisis, ask others to pray for you. That's part of it. But may I say to you this, please, let the first thing you do be to go to God. That's part of consistency in prayer. He, he's the one who will help you. He's the one who will strengthen you. We see this with Daniel. We see this with Jesus himself. He goes to his father. He's going to have to pick 12 disciples. Who are they going to be? And God gives him as he's communing with his father throughout that night. Then he comes and then he chooses the 12. <clears throat> so we have a pattern of Daniel and Jesus. And if they needed it, how much more do we need it as well? So here's some scriptures for you, just to encourage you this morning. <coughs> um, so we've got two strong examples. Now here's some verses for us. 
Acts 2.42, remember this in the early church, all the believers devoted themselves, there's that word again, right? Devoted to, um, to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, sharing in meals, and to prayer. So it's the pattern of the early church, which is a pattern for us as well. Ephesians 6.18, Pray in the Spirit at all times on every occasion. How many of you say, I can't do that. I got to work. <laughs> okay. Did you know you can pray with your eyes open? You can pray with a few words. You don't have to, you don't have to fold your hands. You don't have to kneel. You don't, your hands don't have to go up. You can just, as you're going about your business and as you're doing your thing, you can say, oh, Jesus, help me right now. Oh, God, help me with this. Just, just as you go through the day, Ephesians 6, 18, at all times, on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Colossians 4, 2, Devote yourselves to prayer. There's that same word again, right? Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. That makes our prayers, it hones the edge of our prayers, right? Um, with an alert mind and a thankful heart. May I say something else? If you pray and your mind wanders, does your mind ever wander when you're praying? Moi aussi. <laughs> okay, same thing for me. Everybody, everybody battles that. Everybody struggles with that. If you find your mind wandering, don't give up and don't say, oh, I'm so terrible. Just get back on track and keep on praying. Just, just get back on get track. Keep praying. And you'll find as you do that more and more that you will be strengthened in prayer to persist and keep a focus. First Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually or constantly or never stop praying. Okay? So here is this first part um, that that so prayers for each one of us so if you feel that ah oh, it's for prayer warriors it's not I'm not a prayer warrior um, that's okay you don't have to be a prayer warrior I do believe there are prayer warriors I do believe in the church there are those that have really a deep gift of prayer they find their greatest joy in spending hours or long sessions in prayer may I say this to you if you'll be open to the Lord and do what he leads you to do, you will find the greatest joy and the greatest fulfillment in the area of your gifts. Did you know that? You will. You'll, and you said, well, I don't know. You know what? Ask God. And then ask yourself, okay, what, what brings you joy? What brings you contentment in your heart? And for some of, I already know in Lighthouse there are some. Um, I know who, I don't know everyone, but I know who you, who you are. I know that you love to pray. And you love to pray a lot. Paul talks about Epaphras. You say Epaphras, it's in the book of Colossians. And he says, Epaphras is with him. And you know what Paul says about Epaphras? He says, uh, Epaphras is here with me and I commend him to you. He's one of your own. He is constantly praying for you, fighting in the spirit for you. Well, here's somebody with a prayer gift, okay? It's somebody with a prayer and you may have that as well. But for all of us, as we can see from these verses, you don't have to have a prayer gift to be a prayer, right? These are for every one of us. And so here we have some of these verses. And some of you right now are saying, I, I, okay, I, I'm convicted. Yes, I should be praying more. So how should I get started? May I recommend to you a great book on prayer, a great book. It's the best I've ever read. Would you hold up that book on your lap? The Bible is the best book on prayer I've ever read. I've ever read. You say, you, some of you thought I was going to give you another title, right? <laughs> By Smith Wigglesworth or whatever. Hey, those are great books on prayer too, but the best book you can go to to help you with prayer is the Bible. Do you know why? The Bible will put meat in your prayers. It really will. Have you ever prayed and you don't even know what to pray? You pray, oh, God, help me. Uh, Lord, thank you. Uh, Lord, I bless you. Uh, Lord, help my family. Uh, all of us get like that sometimes, don't we? May I say to you, if you will get some meat from the Bible, your prayers are going to change. And may I recommend one specific part of the Bible? What might that be? Old Testament, book of? Thank you. Book of Psalms. Do you know what the book of Psalms is? It's a book of prayer. It's a book of prayer. 
everything you go through, you're going to find it in Psalms. Are you going through a hard time? You'll find it in Psalms. Are you joyful? You'll find it in Psalms. Have you been betrayed? You'll find it in Psalms. Have you sinned and fallen short? You'll find it in Psalms. You'll find it all there. You'll find it all there. Go to the book of Psalms, and if you say, well, I don't know how, let that be your words, let that be the words of your prayer. How many of you like to sing, and you remember words of songs? That's one of, th that's something I do in prayer also. And I'll just, I just sing songs at times. And I may not be singing very well because I'm <laughs> climbing the mountain. But God doesn't care because it's coming from my heart. It's coming from my heart. So sing songs to the Lord. Let this be part. So just get started. Just get started and start with consistent prayer. Just start. Just start. If you say, I I'll try, but it's so hard. May I say something to you? Get your phone and set a timer. Just set a timer on your phone. You say, how long? It's up to you where are you starting from? If you don't pray at all, well, set a timer for three or four or five minutes and try that. And you say, oh, scandalous. No, I have to pray. Well, if you're praying zero now, five minutes is pretty good, right? And Jesus does not condemn. So just start. Just start. Second thing you can do, ready? Get a prayer partner. Get a prayer partner. May I recommend a prayer partner to you? <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit also joins to help us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. How many of you don't know what to pray for as you should? I don't sometimes. Get help from the Holy Spirit. You and I come to prayer and we're so condemned, we're so convicted, and we think, well, I can't. May I say to you that God, the Holy Spirit, is there. He knows you're weak in prayer. He knows you don't know how to pray. He knows you're discouraged and you want to give up. And do you know what he does? He issues no word of condemnation. Instead, as you pray, he comes alongside and he prays with you. So I encourage you, go to him and say, Holy Spirit, I want to be consistent in prayer. Would you help me? Would you help me as I pray right now and receive the help of the Holy Spirit? What's so wonderful about this is that the Holy Spirit prays perfect prayers. Perfect prayers. Perfect prayers. Isn't that encouraging? Perfect prayers. So, Let's be faithful or consistent in prayer. So here's the first word, consi consistent in prayer. And here's the second one. The second word, so the first one is be consistent in prayer. The, the, the first one is be consistent in prayer. The second one is, ready, be persistent in prayer. Okay? So first one, consistent. Second one, persistent. persistent. You're kind of like a mosquito. Maybe that's a good way to think about it. Have you ever had a mosquito in your house? Swatted away. Three minutes later, he's back. You swat him away. Two minutes later, he's back. Mosquitoes are persistent, aren't they? And that's not a very good example. We're going to look at some better examples. But be persistent in prayer. Be persistent in prayer. Consistent comes first. Persistent will follow, okay? Persistent will follow. Um, I have frequently, last, last week I mentioned to you my, uh, I think it was last week, my great aunt Rhoda. I, I was trying to find a picture of her last night and I don't have one with me. But I'd called mom and dad, my dad the other day to say, dad, how long did aunt Rhoda pray for Uncle Ed? Remember I'd, I'd mentioned that to you and I told you he prayed, she prayed for him a long time. Um, and for those of you, I think most people know, but if, for anyone who doesn't, um, Aunt Rhoda was my dad's aunt. Uh, very, very godly family, um, very godly uh, father, uh, Grandpa Stevens. And um, at a very, I think she was about 14 or 15, she fell in love with this uh, young guy named Ed, who loved her and was very kind to her, but he wasn't a Christian. And Aunt Rhoda wanted to marry him, and Grandpa Stevens said, no, you may not marry him. Uh, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. And she, they locked her in her room to keep her away from him. And she ran away. And she married him. 
um, when she was about 15 years old. And probably within weeks of marrying him, Uncle Ed, instead of being the kind and loving young guy that she thought he was, turned into just one of the meanest, most unpleasant people any of us have ever known, R truly unpleasant. In, in my childhood and in my growing up years, I never heard Uncle Ed say one, one kind or nice word in all the time I knew him. And you know what? Some of you have been around people like that, and some of you may have had family members like that. Some of you may have had parents like that. So Aunt Rhoda was married to him, and she loved God, and she began to pray for him, and he, was, he persecuted her, and I've, I've talked about that before. He persecuted her, but Aunt Rhoda was consistent in prayer and persistent in prayer. There was never a time whenever we would meet her when we were together that at the end of spending time with Aunt Rhoda, she, that she would ever forget to say, okay, now let's pray. And she was just a hardworking Southern farm wife, you know. She had a beautiful garden and she worked hard. But always at the end of every visit, she would say, okay, let's pray. And when Aunt Rhoda prayed, heaven opened. She, she was a prayer warrior. And she was consistent in her prayers all the time, every time. She was always praying. But not only was she consistent in her prayers, she was persistent in her prayers as well. And she prayed for her husband. She prayed for Uncle Ed. And on his deathbed, Uncle Ed accepted the Lord. And just, Dad said it was just a few hours later, he went to be with the Lord. I said, how long were they married? And Dad was trying to figure it out. He said, as far as I know, it was about 60 years. 60 years. She prayed for him for 60 years. But God answered that prayer. God answered that persistent prayer. So for me, that's one of my personal examples of consistent and persistent prayer. Um, and I want to, as we look at that, I, I want to give you an example, because you don't know Aunt Rhoda, but you'll meet her in heaven. Um, and, uh, but I want to give you some examples that you know that, w that we're going to look at. A lot of us go to the Bible and we know uh, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, Jesus teaches how to pray, right? And we've studied the Lord's Prayer before. And he says, well, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Most of us stop with the Lord's Prayer. We don't keep on going and look at what Jesus continues to teach about prayer right after the Lord's Prayer. You find it in Matthew, you'll find it in Luke. Do you know what Jesus teaches right after the Lord's Prayer? You look it up in Matthew and Luke and in other places, and you will see that Jesus continues his teaching on prayer by talking about persistence in prayer. And we miss that. Did you know that? Most of the time, we miss that. But Jesus put it right together with, um, this is how to pray, our Father which art in heaven. And then he goes on in teaching about prayer and says, this is how to be, I want you to be persistent in prayer. Look at this from Luke 18, one, one day Jesus, now this is a little bit later, not, not connected to uh, um, uh, the Lord's prayer, but sometime later, but we're going to look at that. He told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not become discouraged and give up. Are you one of his disciples? Jesus is talking to us this morning to be persistent in prayer. So here's an example, but then look with me at Luke. And we're not going to read it all, but we know this one. So this is from Luke 11, 5 to 10. Um, and he gives several different stories. Here it is, and he says, teaching them more about prayer. This is after the Lord's Prayer. You go to a friend's house at night. You knock on the door. It's almost midnight because... Uh, a neighbor, a, a visitor has come and you don't have any food in your house, and but you want to feed them. In Middle Eastern custom, you had to give them something to eat. So you go to your neighbor and you say, please lend me three loaves of bread. And your neighbor, who's a good friend, says, sorry, I'm asleep and all, we, we're all asleep. Go away. Go away. But you persist. And you say again, please, I need three loaves of bread. Go away. I don't want to wake up the kids. If I wake up the kids, the baby will start crying. We just got the baby to sleep. Please, please give me three loaves of bread. 
Now, I don't know about you, but that guy sounds pretty annoying, doesn't he? You've told him, go away, three times. Isn't it interesting that Jesus tells a story like that? And how's it, how does it end? He says, if you keep on knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your bold persistence, right? Because of your bold persistence. Some of, some of us feel like, well, I've asked God three times. Okay, Lord, I guess the answer is no. Keep on. Keep on. This is the story that Jesus gives. So we should be encouraged this morning. Now, don't stop there because you know what verses come right after this? You ready? You know this. Ask, seek, knock. These verses come right after this. And if you go to Matthew chapter 6 and 7, you'll see the same thing. So Jesus tells that story and then he follows up just in case we missed the point. And he says, and so I tell you, keep on asking, you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking, receives. Everyone who knocks and every, everyone who seeks and keeps on seeking, that's what the language means, finds. And to everyone who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door will be opened. Some of us this morning have been asking and we stopped asking because we didn't receive. Some of us have been seeking this morning in prayer and we stopped seeking because we didn't find. Some of us this morning have been knocking and we stopped. Knocking's the hardest one, by the way, isn't it? That's the hardest one. And we stopped knocking because the door didn't open. May I encourage you this morning with the words of Jesus to us, not the lies of the enemy that tell you, tough luck, the door's not going to open, you're not going to find, you're not going to receive. The answer is no. Ask, seek, and knock, and Jesus says, you will find, you will receive, the door will be opened. But there has to be persistence in prayer. So if your heart has grown tired about continuing in prayer in a specific area, I encourage you this morning. Jesus encourages you this morning. This is not my story. I have the story of Aunt Rhoda, but that's just one story. Here's a story that covers every one of us. And Jesus wants to know it, wants us to know it, because it is a key, a key to receiving from the Lord. It is persevering prayer. It's persevering prayer. I don't know about you, but as I have been studying and preparing over the last few weeks and even before then, the Lord has been encouraging me to continue in prayer. One of the things that I pray for is just a personal thing, and you may be praying for something else. Most of you know that my mother is legally blind uh, because of uh, a macular degeneration, um, and it, it is continuing. May I tell you what I'm praying for, for my mom? I'm praying for the Lord to restore her sight. You say, oh, she has macular degeneration. She's blind. God raised a dead man. Amen. I'm praying for her eyesight. And I'm going to pray until God tells me, Jennifer, I'm not going to heal her eyesight. Stop praying for that. Pray for something else. Some of you have stopped praying for something. I'm going to go ahead and get ahead. Uh, uh, just in case we don't get to it later, but let me just say it this way. Some of you have stopped praying for something because you believe the answer is no. Yes? May I say to you, sometimes the answer is no. It, it is no, isn't it? But I think most of the time, we have not prayed until we've received the answer no. We have only prayed until we've got tired and discouraged in prayer. That's how far we've gone. And some of us may say, yeah, but you know, remember Paul, he had that thorn in the flesh and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. You go back and you read that. Um, it's in, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I, we probably won't get to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you will see, Paul prays, there's no answer. Paul prays again, there's no answer. Paul prays one more time, and on the third time, so here's this picture of persistent prayer, right? In this persistent prayer, the third time, God answers him and basically says, I will not remove this thorn in the flesh, but my grace will be sufficient for you in this situation. Some of us, most of us, probably all of us, 
need to persist in prayer until we have the answer. And if God doesn't give you an answer for your situation, if you have not yet received, if you have not yet found, if the door has not yet opened, you keep on asking, you keep on seeking, you keep on knocking until God gives the answer. If you have not yet received an answer, I believe God speaks to us. And if the answer is no, God can tell us no. But may I say to you, God's no will not crush us. Paul says, so your grace is sufficient. So I will rejoice in the weakness because when I'm weak, I'm strong. If God's answer is no, he will sustain you. He will keep you through it. But don't let the devil let you get, make you discouraged just because you've asking and you haven't received, just because you're seeking and you haven't found, just because you're knocking and the door hasn't opened. Get an answer from God. Get an answer from God, not from the devil, not from the devil. Jesus calls us to persist in prayer, to persist in prayer until the answer comes. And if he says no, he'll sustain you through the no, brothers and sisters. He will. He will. But don't give up before then. And so this is, so Jesus prays. Um, we're not going to have time to, so, sorry, <laughs> there's, God answers. Why do we persist in prayer? Because God answers persistent prayer. Okay? And God may have a purpose. May I say to you, sometimes we go through things and we know God is working, but there's no answer yet. And sometimes God is doing something in us, right? He's working in us, and that's why the answer is long in coming. But don't give up in the middle. Don't give up in the middle. Keep on keeping on, right? Keep on, keep on keeping on. We'll look at another verse in just a second. We're not going to have time to get to it this morning, but I want to just give you the reference, and then we'll get on to some other things. Look at this. I, I, I told you I was going to give you Old and New Testament examples this morning. Take, take a look at this just a minute. Here's this beautiful picture of prayer in the Old Testament. This is a, a message or two or three all by itself. But look at, at um, in... Uh, in where okay Exodus 17 8 through 13 it is, it's such an unusual thing we've seen it before but what I want to say to you is this just take a look uh, I'll, you can read most of us know this it's uh, they've left Egypt uh, Moses is leading and the Amaleks or the Amalekites come out and attack God's people and this is an Old Testament picture of persistence in prayer you say what it's an Old Testament picture of persistence in prayer. Okay, take a look. Now, there are many things here. I don't want to stretch it, but I want us just to see this very simple thing. They come out, they attack, and so Moses said to Joshua, choose some men, uh, by the way. So choose some men, go out. I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. You know what Moses is going to do the next day? He already tells him what he's going to do. Moses is going to pray. That's what it means. He'll stand on the top of the hill with his hands up and the staff of God. And he, said, and he says to Joshua, you go and you fight. May I say one thing to you? This is the first time we see the name Joshua in this battle. Joshua is the Old Testament form of which name? Jesus. Here's this beautiful picture, beloved. Jesus goes out and he fights the battle as Jesus has won the battle for you and me. Moses is praying. I said, well, who's Moses? Don't, don't, don't get bogged down in that. It's a picture of prayer. It's a picture of prayer. His hands are up and look at verse, uh, sorry, look at, <laughs> sorry, look at verse 11. As long as Moses held up his hands, Israel won. Whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But his hands grew weary. Do you know that in persistent prayer, we get weary, don't we? We get tired. Do you know why? It's hard work. Do you know why? You've got a strong enemy. You've got, we've got a strong enemy. We do. There's a strong enemy. But when we prevail in prayer, the victory is won. And how's it end? So Joshua defeated Amalek. 
and his army with the sword. Here's this beautiful picture of prayer. So I want to encourage you, some of you this morning, and I'm not saying you have to lift your hands in prayer. That's not the point. It's a symbol of prayer. Some of you this morning, in prayer, your hands. <laughs> You've gotten so tired, haven't you? You've gotten so tired. Raise your hands up in prayer again. Raise your hands up. Because in prayer, persistent prayer, the victory is won. The victory is won. And it's worth it. This gives us a, an example, an outward example of, of the reward of persistent prayer, right? Because you see these Amaleks, when they came out, this was at the beginning of their journey on the way to the Promised Land. And if the Amaleks had been able to stop them at this point, they never would have made it into the promised land. They never would have made it into everything God had for them. And some of us are in battles now and our hands have gotten so tired. And if we give up now, we're not going to make it through to all the things that God has for us. God has victory for us. Don't give up now and don't stop. Don't stop praying. This is a physical example, but what we really know is this. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. And I, and I want to encourage you this morning. I wanted to put this with the preceding one. Because you and I, in some of the battles we fight, we target, our target is people, right? Do you have somebody who, per, who persecutes you? Do you have somebody who makes your life hard? May I say to you, your enemy is not that person. Now, the enemy may be using that person, but your enemy is the enemy. Okay, your enemy is the enemy, and we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And he gives us tools. He gives us tools to fight against the enemy. So use those tools. Use those tools. Brothers and sisters, it comes in prayer, and it comes in persistent prayer. And do you know why some things take asking and keep on, to keep on asking? Some things seeking and you keep on seeking. Knocking and you keep on knocking. It's because some of these things for which we are praying are so precious and they're so valuable. They are people's souls for eternity. That's the most precious thing on this world, in this world. And there are other things that are valuable to us as well. And if the enemy is holding these things in his hand and saying, I am not letting go. No, they're mine. It's going to take persistent prayer to loose the grip of the enemy on that person's life. It's going to take persistent prayer to loose the enemy on your family, on your health, on your finances, in your business, in any one of these areas. The, the, the least valuable things are, are easily won. They're easily won. Just ask, right? But some things you're going to have to seek and some things you're going to have to find. You can, uh, you're going to have to knock. And you're going to have to keep on knocking. And so this is where our battle is. Get your eyes off of people. If, you've been, if your eyes have been on people, get your eyes. Say, oh God, oh God, Jesus fight for me. And Jesus has fought for us. He has fought for us. I'm going to skip some things. Probably next week I'll come back to it. Let me go through. Uh, I'm going to go through some things because it's just about time to stop. Um, you can read Daniel 10. I went back to Daniel again. Uh, and then... Let me, just, let me just skip through some other things. This is in Daniel 10. Persistent prayer. I'm going to close with just some of these things. But I will call on God, and the Lord will rescue me morning, noon, and night. Morning, noon, and night, brothers and sisters. I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. Are you in distress? Morning, noon, and night. Morning, noon, and night. I grew up, after Singapore, I grew up in the U.S. where the hot water system is very different than in most places in Hong Kong. Here in Hong Kong, we don't have a lot of room in our houses, right, or in our apartments. And so in Hong Kong, I discovered this incredible machine that is on the wall, and you turn on the hot water, and the hot water is immediately there, right? I don't even, what's it called? It's called a, what's it called, Chris? 
an instantaneous water heater. <laughs> I thought there was a clever name. <laughs> so there you go. So it's this instant thing. Well, we never had that in the U.S. We had, because there's a lot more room, we had a hot water tank. Any of you have hot water tanks now? Hong Kong mole, not so much, right? But the hot water tank would be in a distant area of the house, out of the way, because it takes a lot of room. It was about this big, it's about this big around, I mean, it takes up a lot of room. And the hot water heater is in the hot water tank, and it's always hot. And so wherever I am, in the shower, or in the kitchen, or in the shower, so here's the example. I turn on the hot water heater, now, I think we used this example, it was in one of the things that we listened to recently, and I, I thought, that's such a good example for prayer. So I turn on the hot water, let's say I, I hop in the shower, I turn on the hot water in America, and I would jump back and scream because the water was cold, right? Because it took a while for the hot water to get from the tank to me, where I had the faucet, where I had the water faucet on. And um, when I was listening to, and some of us were listening to this sermon, it's such a wonderful example of persistence in prayer. Because a lot of us are praying, we have our hand on the faucet, we've turned it on, and we're waiting for the hot water, and it's cold, and it's cold, and it's cold, and it's cold. And we just give up, and we turn off the hot, and we turn, off, turn it off, right? Well, I guess no hot water. But hot water was on the way, wasn't it? It was on the way. But I just didn't persist. I just didn't wait for it. And I turned it off. I, well, there's no hot water. There's no hot water. Some of us have turned off the faucet in prayer. We've been waiting for hot water. And it's been a while in coming. May I say to you, imperfect example, but turn it back on. And you keep it turned on until the hot water comes out the faucet. You keep it on. You keep it on. I will call on God. He will rescue me. The Lord hears my voice. May I say something to you? This Oh, look. It's that great book on prayer psalm again. We're going to end with this. And maybe next week we'll come to some other things. I like this. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. So encouraging. Now this is the confidence we have before Him. Whenever we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked him for. And some of you are saying, I don't have that confidence. You know why you don't have that confidence? We haven't learned to be consistent in prayer. And we haven't learned to persist, to be persistent in prayer. You hang in there. You start where you are. There's no condemnation here. You just start. Start. And keep on. And don't stop. And you will have this confidence. He hears your voice and he will answer. We're going to close in prayer this morning. And you pray for you and I'm going to pray for you. I've already prayed for me, so I'm going to pray for you. Okay? And I, I want you to ask what the Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning. And then my question to you is, what are you going to do about it? You want to keep on as you're keeping on? You're doing just fine? Or you say, nope, I, I'm, I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to be persistent. Lord, we come to you this morning in this matter of prayer. And God, you have said your Holy Spirit will help us when we pray and will help us in our weakness in prayer. Would you help us please? Father, I pray for those this morning who have grown discouraged and lost heart in prayer this morning. They've prayed and prayed and prayed, but Lord, the answer hasn't come. And so they've just said, well, I guess it's no. Or they think, well, it doesn't work. Father, I pray this morning, help your people to reject the lies of the devil who knows if we pray persistently, he will lose and we will win. Help your people this morning. Pull our hearts to pray consistently. Pull our hearts to pray persistently until we receive the answer that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.